Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Cambridge Azure and the model number is 640A and this is the version 1 amplifier. In terms of general specifications power output is 65 watts per channel and that's into 8 ohms but this will increase to 100 watts if you have 4 ohm speakers. Frequency response is 5 hertz up to 50 kilohertz and your total harmonic distortion is 0.005%. In terms of inputs, auxiliary CD tuner DVD and also AV and tape. For this amplifier, you can also insert if you're able to obtain one. And sometimes on auction websites, they do become available. The moving magnet input board. And there's just two links on the input side of the amplifier, which you just need to cut through. And then you can then have directly a turntable connected. Individual controls for bass, treble and balance. Headphone socket quarter inch jack for personal or private listening. Um, with the direct mode you can bypass the tone control circuits. And this amplifier also has a pre-amplifier output. And then dimensions wise you're looking at width of 430mm by a depth of 320 and a height of 100mm. And the amplifier weighs 7kg. It is also supplied with a remote control. So that remote control enables you to select any of the inputs because it's electronic switching and then you can also operate the motorized volume control as well as placing the amplifier into standby mode. Now when this amplifier came into the workshop it actually had three different faults and we'll get into those in a moment. The first thing that I'm showing you of course is the top of the amplifier with the cover removed and what you can see is that there is an extensive amount of dust the amplifier has probably not been kept in the best environment though as part of repair and service I undertook the work then to remove all of this dust and debris from all of the circuit boards. Now the first issue with this amplifier was that if you connected the power onto the rear socket and then the amplifier will just power up but it will be in standby mode. When you press the push button on the front fascia Normally what should happen is that the relay on the startup board should energize and then that provides the power then to the toroidal and then in turn that will power up all of the relevant circuits. Now that relay was energized and you heard it operate but within a couple of seconds what you found was that the amplifier switched to protection mode and the protection LED on the front was just strobing one time. Now I've put a link in the description to the video just to explain what Cambridge Audio call their cap five protection system. Now the DC protection fault is common on these amplifiers and what it's linked to again is this brown glue which dries out and becomes corrosive. So if you see this protection single flash from the front what you need to do is just to connect your negative multimeter to one of the negative speaker terminals and then what you're looking at is the supply voltage. So what I'm doing is I'm simply pressing the push button on the front. It will energize momentarily the startup relay, but that will be sufficient time for me to check if I've got the correct voltage either side of the resistor, which is R43. So as soon as I put the meter on to the other side of the resistor, then I had no voltage. So that told me straight away that that resistor had gone open circuit. And I'll show you in a moment. Now, to get access to the circuit boards, and then what this photograph is showing you is the multitude of screws that you need to remove. So you're going to have to remove all these self-tapping screws to remove the back panel. And then you have eight screws just go through then to the heat sink underneath. And then you also have to remove the fixing screws which hold the front fascia in position to the base plate. And then also the side panel so you can get access to everything that we need to check as part of the repair and service. I'm not singularly just looking to fix the DC protection issue or DC fault. I have other work to do and I'll go in more detail in a moment. So here when you look from the top, this is the circuit board which has now been released. And there's two plastic stand-up pillars that you need to just pinch in with a pair of pliers and then you can lift the circuit board up. You'll also need to disconnect the interconnecting wiring between the front input stroke tone control board and the main amplifier board. And then what I'm showing you is just the underside of that circuit board and it's extremely busy. You can see all these different links and cable connections 
And remember, as always, you do need to check all of the solder joints. You'll find on some of the voltage regulators, if the amplifier is seeing good service, that they will definitely re need resoldering. But the copper tracks on these amplifiers is not the best. It's very, very thin. So just be very careful because you can find that if you put a little bit too much heat on there or just linger the soldering iron, the track could come away. And also as well, some of the connections are extremely close to one another. So it's very easy to do a solder bridge. So just again, verify and then check your work. So what I've done here is I've took a side photograph and I've removed the resistor. So you can see what has happened. The glue, instead of it flowing over the top of the resistor in this case, what has happened, and probably better from this photograph, because I've removed one of the smoothing capacitors, you can see that it's flowed underneath. And that's what has happened. So it's literally rotted the resistor away to the point that it has gone open circuit. So what do you need to do? Well, as always, once I've removed the resistor, I just use eye protection. And then what I'll do is I'll remove all of this hard lacquer type glue to make sure that when the new resistor is fitted, you're not going to have an issue with this corrosive effect. And also as well, remember that this glue also goes conductive. So for these amplifiers, sometimes you can get like random triggering of different protection modes, depending on how the LED is strobing. And what you'll find is that this glue has been coating multiple components or it could be coating some of the links on the circuit board. You have to remove all the glue. And what you see now is that resistor. And you can see the poor condition that it's in. It's literally rotted the resistor away. And when you look at the search function on my YouTube channel, you'll find that there are literally maybe 100 plus different repair videos which always will come back to this particular resistor failure on either the negative power supply or the positive power supply rails for the amplifier module or amplifier circuit board. Now, once I'd replaced that, what you don't want to do is just reassemble the complete amplifier. In this instance, there was two additional faults. So if I'd reassembled it, then I have to go back and I have to disassemble. That's a lot of time and effort and remove all of those screws. So I put the amplifier on to test. And before I connect any speakers, I just plug in my headphones. And what I could hear is with no input signal connected, there was a 100 hertz power hum. And you could hear it and it's on both channels. Now, if you did connect an input source and I increased the volume maybe to about 20%, the audio was sufficiently high enough just almost to kind of mask out this power hum. But of course, that hum should never be present. Now, I know from experience where the failure is. And what I'm indicating now are the smoothing capacitors which are used for the low voltage power supplies. So this is where you have the power supplies, which is the 5 volt for the microprocessor stroke microcontroller. And then you then have the plus and minus voltage regulators. And these are supplying the 15 volt supplies. So it provides 15 volts for the input selection IC. And it's also providing 15 volts plus or minus to all of the operational amplifiers in the tone control and signal processing part of the amplifier. So with these capacitors being open circuit or very, very high ESR and low value, and on the right hand side, what you can see is four rectification diodes. Once the rectification of the AC had taken place, what we were left with was a 100 hertz ripple. And that's what you hear. And it's very, very loud. I would not say that this design is the best either, because what they've done is they've crammed in the electrolytic capacitors and they're quite close to the heat sink of the voltage regulators. Now these are rated at one amp, so they are generating some heat. So that means that the capacitors or the electrolyte inside the capacitors will deteriorate quicker than what they should. Also as well in this amplifier, you don't tend to see, I'd say quality brand capacitors. The ones that I remove have got Acorn written on them. You know, I'm not familiar with that brand. So what I do is I just replace them and then fit some high quality Panasonic capacitors in. So just to highlight the point you can see here that the capacitors have been put onto the ESR meter and this is completely open circuit the ESR meter cannot detect that capacitor at all and then this capacitor here what you can see is that the ESR is going high so again it's starting to the point where it's deteriorating and then of course would fail so we just block change all those capacitors out then put the amplifier back on test and completely noise free now, part of the repair and service for this amplifier is to look at the relays, and there are two. One of the relays is mounted on the startup board that you see here. Now, you can imagine for that toroidal transformer, every time that relay is switching, there's some arcing on the terminals. And remember, this amplifier is decades old. So what I do is I just simply cut the cable ties, so I'm able then to release the 
plastic pillars which hold the circuit board in place. Raise it up and then I then will replace the relay and I'll put the specification in the write-up for this video description. I also verify that there's no dry solder joints because sometimes on the Euro socket some of the pins can become brittle and the solder breaks away. You can also see as well the banks and fuses with the relevant covers on top. And then what I also focus on as well is the input board stroke tone board. You will often find dry solder joints also on the RCA sockets and then also on the balance, bass and treble controls towards the front and then also the selection switches. And then here you can see that this is the speaker protection relay and this is on the speaker protection circuit board. So again, over time they become oxidised, can cause distortion and intermittent loss of sound. So I just replace those relays. Now, the other issue that we had with this amplifier was associated with the input selection. Now, when I looked at this circuit board, which is the microcontroller board, the way in which you get access to it is there are multiple fixing screws at the rear. And once you remove them, you'll then be able just to pull the module away and you can see that there's a large integrated circuit that is the microcontroller and then you see these series of push buttons. Now the microcontroller will read the status of those push buttons and in turn it will illuminate the relevant LED that you can see here. They look white in appearance and these will turn blue and then it will then in turn send the command signal for example to the input selection IC to select the appropriate input. Now all of the push buttons seemed to work properly, they were very very responsive, you just touch them to select and everything was good. But the DVD input one was not. If you pressed it sometimes it would make contact, sometimes it wouldn't. And what you'd need to do is almost sort of roll it around just to get the contact. So that's not going to be good for the customer. And remember these push buttons are readily available. It's not something you can take apart and clean the contacts. So I just simply replaced it and then before I put the board back in I just operated them and absolutely perfect operation. So just to sort of recap we found the issue with the push button as I said on the input selection. We also had the noise due to the failed electrolytic capacitors on the low voltage power supply and we also had this failure of the resistor for the power supply rail for the amplifier module. Now, once all that work was done, and we also used Deoxid to clean the user control, so these are the selection switches, and then also the balance, treble, and bass, and volume control potentiometers, we now have to align the amplifier. Now, the way in which you do that is very, very easy on this amp. It's not difficult at all. And what Cambridge have done is instead of providing just a single-term preset potentiometer, you have a 10-turn, which is better, because it enables you then to make a more precise adjustment. So as always, leave the amplifier running, probably for about 20 minutes. No inputs connected, no speakers, volume control at minimum, and your other user controls at midpoint. And then what you need to do is to set your multimeter then to DC millivolts. And I'm interested to measure across the test point there. So it's just one of the emitter resistors. And then what I'm doing is I'm simply adjusting it until I read 13 millivolts. Do it for the left channel and then do it for the right. The channel, and this is the left channel, is 11.56 millivolts. And then once we've made the adjustment, you can see that this has now been correctly aligned to 13 millivolts. Repeat again. So now for the right channel, and this is slightly lower at 10.82 millivolts. And then final adjustment is going to bring you back up to 13 millivolts. And it just makes sure that the output transistors, which are the Sankin SAP15 series, both N and P-type are running at their optimum operating bias. They're not being overdriven. And then here you can see the failed components. So what I've done is I've replaced a number of the electrolytic capacitors. The ones on the low voltage power supply were replaced. And then also the capacitors which were near to R43 and then R41, I replaced those. They were slightly high ESR, but they hadn't gone completely. But I did do an ESR check on all the remaining capacitors and all of those seem to be good. And then finally, after the amplifier is cleaned, it's placed onto test, normally for about three to four hours, and the amplifier performed faultlessly, no issues whatsoever. And then it's a case of the amplifier just being boxed up and then returned back to the customer. So I appreciate you stopping by, and if you need any help, support, or guidance, by all means, email audioamplifierservicing at aol.com and I'll be happy to come back to you and provide any guidance or support that you may require. 
So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.